How's everyone doing? <laughs> All right. Be careful what you ask for. That old saying is true. I can remember as a youth, I asked the Lord one time to use me. Be careful what you ask for. I asked him to use me to be an instrument for his will, for something that's greater for him. I wanted my life to have some type of meaning, uh, a sense of a purpose, uh, some value. I knew that at an early age. I wanted to, it was okay if he used my life for that student who was contemplating suicide. It was okay if he used me for that mother or that young lady who was dealing with teenage pregnancy. It was okay if he used me for that young man who was thinking about just committing a crime or just giving up or just didn't know exactly what to do. I was okay with that at an early age. Um, he could use me for beauty and strength. He could use me for beauty and weakness. I was okay with that at an early age. And I asked for that. So it took some time, but he had to break me. Then he had to make me, mold me, and then fill me. And what he filled me with was the skills of photography, creativity, and storytelling. He gave me a platform to inspire people, to inspire many. And now he's increasing my platform to inspire you. One day, I was at a spoken word event, and I was asked to speak. I had no idea what I wanted to talk about. Um, I really didn't have anything to talk about, but for some reason, I said, yes, I'll speak tonight. And I got up on the stage, and, and if you know me, I, I like to joke a lot. And um, I cracked a joke or two, and, and then I said, hey, I got a project that I'm thinking about doing. And in this project, what I want to do is I'm going to take your stories, and I'm going to combine them with my images, and we're going to tell some stories, and we're going to shock the world. And the crowd went silent. I mean silent. And... I turned around and went back off stage, and there was a line of people behind me. And they all wanted to know, Richie, I want to know more about this story. I want to know more about what you're doing. At this point, I'm still nervous because I had no idea where those words came from. But I knew one thing. I asked the Lord to use me, and I have to be careful about what I'm asking for. Next slide. See, everyone has a story. The people who were backstage, I told them that I had an epiphany. And with this epiphany, I saw myself taking 50, 50 images, 50 photographs of 50 people on 50 consecutive days, allowing them to tell their stories in 50 words or less. All this while I would be using a 50 millimeter lens. Of, all, of those 50 people, some of them I knew, a lot of them I didn't. I had no idea they were complete strangers. But they all had one thing in common. They all had a story to tell. And everyone was longing to hear it. So to get this thing started, I, um, Project 5050, that's pretty much how it was born. It was born right then and there. Um, see, my job was kind of easy. I, my job was supposed to hear the story, visualize an image, photograph it, and share it. To get people an idea where I was going, I used my image first. Because it was just to get people an idea of what I wanted to do. And this was called hurtful words. I don't know the exact 50 words that I used, but I heard a lot of hurtful words that I was growing up as a youth. And those were words that uh, they kind of got permanent scars. If I take my shirt off, you can't see it, but it's on the inside. It took a while for me to actually get over that hurt, but over time, I actually did. I used those painful moments as energy because 
energy if it's positive or negative it's still energy and I just used it for for a positive side and that's why I am where I am today so I have a sister that's a news anchor and I told her what I'm getting ready to do before I do the next next 49 and I, I said I need some help I need a pointer or two so she gave me two pointers pointer number one never show emotion when you listen to somebody's story just go in and be even keel and the reason why, because you never know if you're going to take them over or under the edge. Then there was tip number two. If you get weak and you think that you need to show emotion, refer to rule number one. <laughs> so I tried to do that. So after day one, the next five days were, they were pretty good. You know, but the first one that tested this was actually day six. Day six. It was about a, um, a friend of mine, and she was, um, she was pregnant. And they were expecting, you know, expecting a baby, and uh, a baby boy, supposed to be the name of Darren. And she told me about it. She was excited, and I was excited for her. And then I saw her later, and I said, well, you know, tell me what happened. She said, uh, Richie, the baby was getting ready to come, and it was the loudest silence because the baby was born stillborn. But I had to refer to my rule because I knew if I went in there and I showed emotion, this would take her over under the edge. So she told me the story. I told her my vision. And reluctantly, she said, I think that is a great vision. And here I am like, I'm kind of nervous to tell her my true vision, but I had to tell it. And this is what we came up with. If you notice, she has a, a little monkey on her, uh, on her finger there. They had the room already decorating a little monkey theme. But this one hit me the hardest because I have a son that was about the same age as her son. And then so I went home and I ran past my wife and I went and grabbed my son. I just wanted to hug him all day, all night. My wife came and said, what's wrong? I said, I don't want to talk about it. I just want to keep pushing. Not all the stories were this dark. Some of them were upbeat, you know, for example. We had like greatest joy, the, the future, uh, one brick at a time about a person who lost their house, a, a blurred vision, a faithful. It was about a couple who thought they couldn't have a baby. The doctor told them they couldn't. Now they have four. Um, love is love. Uh, it was about it was about love. That's what it was <laughs> in the next slide. But there were some others. It was about a woman scorn, uh, a woman who was bullied, and she thought that, you know, she really was thinking about suicide, uh, uh, beautiful scars, a woman who had a double vasectomy, uh, know your status. It was about a lady finding out that both her parents died of AIDS, uh, searching, an abortion. So there were, there were different ones in different sizes, different ways. But I tell you, a lot of the times I was ready to just quit because I didn't think I could do this for 49 or 50 days. But I knew that I was doing this for something bigger than me, and it was actually for something much, much greater. One day, when I was, um, these are the, actually the 50 stories that we talked about. One day, uh, about day 13 or 14, I had a doctor's appointment. And in that doctor's appointment, I um, said, well, I'm not gonna post at the normal time. I was blogging about 8 o'clock every morning. So this time, I said, I'm going to blog about uh, when I get out of my doctor's appointment. It's about 10 o'clock. So I checked my phone when I got a doctor's appointment, and I had about, I don't know, numerous missed calls, text messages, and emails. And everyone wanted to know, where is the next story? At that point, I knew that something was going on, something that was much bigger than what I was. I had people... I used a thing called Google Analytics. And with Google Analytics, it actually tells you, you know, statistics about where people are, are, are watching you from and uh, where they're from and where they're located and what time of day. I had people from Brazil, Japan, Canada, China, Spain, the UK, and um, Smallville, Alabama, actually watching and blogging about my stories. So I was pretty happy about that. But out of all of that, I think the thing that was the most important was the email, the, the messages. See, some people will post publicly onto your blog, into your uh, statuses, but it was those private emails that really got me through. 
It was the people who were identifying with exactly what we were talking about and what we were saying. And, uh, you know, I was like, man, this is awesome. This is great. I'm doing something, but it's very taxing on me. But everybody else will get to live and see the other sides of that. So today, though, what I want to do is I like to be able to challenge everyone who can hear my voice and see my face. I just found out in the back that they were live streaming, so my nerves just shot straight through the roof. Um, <laughs> but to use social media as a platform to tell your story, you know, you have a story. And yes, go out there and your next post and your tweet, talk about something that's meaningful to you. You know, tell me some things that what's important to you. Talk about things that what makes you tick, uh, the things that give us a piece of you and tag it like a moment to a movement. Because right now, that's pretty much what we're doing. We're all in here. We all have different moments. But we can take a moment into a movement right here, right now. We actually have the power to inspire and reshape this world right here in this room, us. If we want to stop the hate, racism, sexism, and the other isms, it's up to us. We can do it. Together, we can reshape this world where all those things, they, they won't matter because it's us. We have the control of it. We can do stuff that we talk about lives that matter. All lives matter, but we can do it right here. We can be the ones to reshape it. Doing these 50 days, 50 stories, 50 blog posts, I'm a firm believer that this project was actually sent from God. He used the talents that he gave me, photography, creativity, storytelling, to inspire many. Your talent might not be photography, but whatever it is, find it. Use it. In closing, what most people didn't know about this project was that death actually hit my family three times in the last two weeks of this project. And, you know, it's kind of funny how things that make you weak, you know, right when you're getting ready to end. And, and I was saying, well, I got to finish because my dad always told me, finish what you start, Rich. You're going to finish what you start. And work was, work was demanding, and I was really feeling I was neglecting my family. But I had to finish what I start. I had to finish. And it was actually when I was at my Aunt Lucy's funeral. She was the, like the last of the Mohicans of that, of that age group of like my parents and them. And, and I was there, and we were at the church, and we were at St. Paul, and I looked at it in there, and the church was, if you've never been to St. Paul, it's in the mob, it's a little church, and it, it was just packed. But when the preacher actually gave the eulogy, it was as if all the people just started to vanish. See, eulogies are not for the dead, it's for the living. But when the people started to vanish, he was talking to me. It was Freddie Moore. Freddie said, well done, that good and faithful servant. And he went on. And I knew at that point in time that he was talking to me. He gave me confirmation at that point in time that what I had asked for, I had gotten. So, and, 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 I, and I knew at that point in time that I knew that at some point in time, I want God to tell me, well done, that good and faithful servant. So I got my confirmation. See, I didn't do this project for riches, for fame, or I did it out of obedience. I, I mean, I know for, for a fact, I'm not going to get my reward. It's not going to be built upon greatness. It's going to be built upon faithfulness. See, these 50 stories were given to me to give to you. If we want to reshape this world, it's going to take more stories. It's going to take my stories, your stories, our stories. So what's your story? Thank you.